The complex number story is a long one, and many brilliant people have played a significant role. Here are some of the more prominent ones. These are some interesting books on complex numbers. Paul Nahan's book, the one in the middle, is rather technical, but the other two are easily readable by non-mathematicians. Philosopher Kelly Ross has written an insightful essay on complex numbers, and his is the only critical treatment I've found on the web. Let me now move on to the complex number story itself. As you probably know, there is no real number solution to an equation such as x squared equals minus 1. A solution would require the square root of a negative number, which doesn't exist in the real domain. The need for something beyond the real numbers thus arises naturally as mathematics develops. My purpose in this video is not to deny this need, or to attack the ideas that resolve the problem, but to critically examine how mathematicians present these ideas to the world. Humankind's conception of the real numbers has expanded over time in order to deal more fully with the physical universe. We began with the natural numbers, which are used for simple counting and thus basic quantification. For example, we can count people, rocks, and cattle. We added the negative numbers to permit quantification in opposing directions. So 10 feet below ground versus 10 feet above ground, wind blowing east, wind blowing west, etc. This created the integers. We invented fractions and decimals to deal with partial quantities, such as half a glass or three quarters of a mile. This gave us the rational numbers. When it was discovered that the diagonal of a square often can't be expressed as a rational number, we added irrational numbers. Such numbers are also required to deal with circular shapes. For any circle, pi is the ratio of its circumference to its diameter. These four types of numbers constitute the real number system, and, note carefully, all of them correspond to things in the real world. So, when we say that x squared equals minus 1 has no real number solution, we're saying that x can't be a natural number, an integer, a rational number, or an irrational number. It must therefore be something else. The question is what, and should we call this solution a number? The answer provided by mathematicians, after a lot of head-scratching over the centuries, is that the solution is i, and that this is indeed a number an imaginary number that is the foundation of the complex number system. Complex numbers do something very desirable in mathematics. They provide algebraic closure. That is, they ensure that every polynomial has at least one solution. Gauss proved this fundamental theorem of algebra in four different ways during his extraordinary career. Operations that can be performed on real numbers can also be performed on complex numbers. They can be added, subtracted, multiplied, divided, treated as exponents, and much more. All this can be done without contradicting the premise that i squared equals minus 1. The complex numbers are thus solved at the procedural level, and the scheme receives strong visual support from the so-called so complex plane. Here the real numbers are on the horizontal axis, and the imaginary numbers are on the vertical axis. The complex numbers are all the points on this so-called plane. Multiplication by i is expressed as a 90 degree counterclockwise rotation, which makes this a handy tool for electrical engineers when dealing with circuits and phases. Complex numbers are also used in several areas of science, especially quantum mechanics. Based on these triumphs, modern mathematicians state with great confidence that the complex numbers are a straightforward extension of the real numbers, in the same way that the integers extended the natural numbers, the rationals extended the integers, and the irrationals extended the rationals. This statement, I maintain, is inaccurate and highly misleading. Between the real and the complex numbers lies a conceptual chasm. Despite the picture of continuity painted by today's mathematicians, the relationship between the real and the complex numbers is one of discontinuity.
Here's what I mean. The story told by mathematicians is based on operations. The subtraction operation can result in negative numbers, so we need integers to permit unrestricted subtraction. Division can result in fractional numbers, so we need rationals to permit unrestricted division. As the last step in this process, we need complex numbers to permit unrestricted use of the square root operation. This was precisely the explanation offered by Stephen Strogatz in his current New York Times series on mathematical concepts. The operations-based story, however, is incomplete, because it considers only the restricted world of mathematical symbols. If we step back and consider not just symbols, but also how these relate to the physical world, the story changes decisively. The real numbers are correctly named because they represent the real world. As indicated earlier, the extension of the real numbers over time reflects our growing desire to manipulate this world, thus requiring increasing symbolic sophistication. This is therefore not a case of the operational tail wagging the numerical dog, as mathematicians would have it, but of operations and numbers expanding in tandem in response to changing human requirements. With this key point in mind, let's re-examine both the need for complex numbers and how this need was met. This diagram represents the problem faced by mathematicians in the 16th century. All the real numbers were in place by that time, but these were insufficient to provide solutions for all possible polynomials. A gap therefore existed between the numbers and their algebraic generalization. One possible response to this problem is depicted here. Simply disallow polynomials that require the square root of negative numbers, thus leaving algebra incomplete. I agree with mathematicians that this approach is unnecessarily restrictive and should be rejected. This represents the actual response by mathematicians. To achieve algebraic closure, the real numbers were extended to include the imaginaries, thus creating the complex number system. The problem with this response is indicated. It destroys the correspondence between numbers and reality. This has serious consequences, some of which I'll discuss later. For now, note that the rationale for extending beyond the reals is completely different from the rationale within the reals. We extend it within the real numbers in order to enhance our mastery of the physical world, a practical objective. We extend it beyond the real numbers in order to achieve algebraic closure, a theoretical objective. If we fixate on operations, this critical distinction is lost, thus falsifying the evolution of mathematical thought. This is the core of the misleading story that's currently being told. Here's my suggested response. The complex number scheme is again used for algebraic closure, so algebra is still complete. However, the imaginaries are not seen as extending the reals, but rather as the symbolic elements of a formal patch that allows us to manipulate the square root of negative numbers without inconsistencies. In this manner, the correspondence between numbers and reality is maintained. The mathematical mechanism itself is untouched, but its presentation is sharply modified. Crucially, we drop the pretense that imaginaries are numbers in the same sense as the reals, and we candidly admit that a somewhat messy but workable non-numerical fix has been developed to fill the gap between numbers and their algebraic expression.